Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is recorded in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. There Luke writes, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is God's word. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Shalom Alechem. John and I had gone up to the temple for worship. We often did that in the afternoon around 3 o'clock, the time of prayer. We'd uh, go up with fellow believers and we'd spend some time in God's house worshiping our Lord and praying. One afternoon, as we approached the temple gate called Beautiful, we came across a crippled man begging for money. I'm sure you've come across people like that too, maybe outside your place of worship or maybe out on a busy city street. The man couldn't work, couldn't even walk, hadn't been able to for a number of years already. Every day his family would bring him here to this gate so he could beg from those who were coming up to the temple for worship. As we walked by, the man looked at us and held out his hand and asked for money. I looked at the guy and felt terrible inside. I didn't have anything to give him. I hadn't brought my money bag along with me that day. And yet my heart went out to him. So I I went over and I said to him, Sir, I don't have any money to give you. I I didn't bring any with me today, but what I I have, I'm glad to share with you. So I took him by the hand and I said to him, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he got up. And walked and ran and jumped. He was completely healed. As you might expect, this minor miracle created a a major commotion there at the temple. We didn't mean to, mind you. We, We didn't mean to cause a disturbance at the temple. God's house, after all, is supposed to be a house of worship, but the guy wouldn't keep quiet. He just kept you know, jumping up and down and praising God. And he kept going around to all the people there in the temple courts and telling them what had happened, that I had healed him, that I had made him well. Pretty soon a crowd had gathered, and I didn't want them to go away with the wrong impression that you know, I was someone special, that I had some magical power to heal people. I wanted them to know the truth, that it was Jesus Jesus was the one with the amazing power. Jesus was the one who had made this man well. So I told them. Actually, we both did. I don't want to take all the credit here. John and I, we told them about Jesus. That he is the promised Savior. The Savior that God had promised to our ancestors. We also reminded them what had happened to Jesus. That a few weeks back during Passover, he had been crucified on Calvary and reminded them that they had played a part in it too. They had rejected him and and called for his crucifixion. But that was also how the Scriptures had been fulfilled and how Jesus had saved us from our sins. And, And those rumors that they had heard about Jesus... They were true. Jesus was alive again. He had risen from the grave and now ascended once again into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and and one day he would come again. So he told them that they should repent and, and look to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation. And many believed. John says it was hundreds of people. I say it was more than a thousand, but it doesn't matter. It was so exciting, so so thrilling to see so many people become followers of Jesus. Not everybody was quite so excited about, though. 
You see, the, this commotion in the temple courts attracted the attention of other people too. Some of the priests, some of the Sadducees, even the, the captain of the temple guard. They too came and listened as we told the people about Jesus. And let's just say they were not very happy about it. You see, it was upsetting enough for the Sadducees that we were talking about someone rising from the dead. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They believe that once you die, that's it. So for them, that was upsetting enough. But then the fact that we were telling people that Jesus was the promised Savior and that He had risen from the grave and, and now people should repent and look to Him as their Savior, that was it. That was the last straw. So they had us arrested right then and there. We were taken to prison and informed that the next day we would have to stay on trial. That was a long night for John and me. We were thinking the worst. You see, that's exactly what they did to Jesus. Had him arrested, put him on trial, and then condemned him to death. John and I were thinking this was probably going to be the end for us too. I'd like to say we weren't afraid. That wouldn't be honest. We were. We did a lot of soul searching that night. Thinking about life. About my life. About Jesus and all the things He had said to us. All the things He had taught us. About His death. And His resurrection. Did a lot of praying that night too. We both did. The next morning, the guards came and got us, and they, they brought us before the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council in Jerusalem. The high priest, Annas, was there. Caiaphas, his son-in-law, was there. The elders were there. The teachers of the law were there. These were our rulers, the highest-ranking officials in the Jewish community. They began to interrogate us asking us all kinds of questions about the events of the previous day and how the crippled man was healed. So I told them. I told them it was because of Jesus. Yes, the very same Jesus they had crucified. I told them that he was alive again, that he had risen from the grave and that he was the one who was responsible for making that man well. And I didn't stop there either. You know me, never was one to hold back too much. Always ready to give people my two cents worth, or four cents, or 20 cents. Sometimes they didn't even have to ask. I also told them that Jesus was the only way to heaven. Salvation is found in no one else, I said. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You know, I think they were caught off guard. I think they were a little surprised by my answer and my confidence. At least they didn't ask us any more questions. Instead, they, they asked us to withdraw for a, for a bit while they discussed our case among themselves. About an hour later, they summoned us back in and announced their verdict. They informed us that they were going to release us without any further punishment. Now John and I were the ones in shock. We couldn't believe it. They're actually going to release us? But here was the catch. Our preaching days were over. They made it clear in no uncertain terms that we were not to talk to anyone or teach anyone about Jesus again. John and I looked at each other. We looked back at the high priest. Sir, we said, in, in all due respect, we can't obey your command. It, it wouldn't be right. 
God has commanded us to teach in Jesus' name. If we obeyed you, we would be disobeying God. Besides, we can't help it. We can't help telling people about the things that we've seen and heard. All the miracles we've seen, the healing of the lame, the healing of lepers, the restoring of sight to the blind, even the raising of the dead, we we can't keep things like that to ourselves. The fact that God loved us so much that He sent His Son to be our Savior. The fact that His Son loved us so much that he, He gave His life for us on the cross so that we might have forgiveness for our sins and might be restored to a right relationship with God. We can't keep things like that to ourselves. The fact that Jesus rose again on the third day, proving that He is indeed the Son of God and has won the victory over sin and death. The fact that because He lives, we too shall live. We can't keep things like that to ourselves. We have to tell others. We can't help speaking about the things we have seen and heard. I wish I had always been that confident, that unafraid to speak up for my Savior Jesus. I'm sure you remember what happened during Holy Week. I know I'll never forget. Friends, I I denied Jesus. I was so afraid that I would be found out. So afraid that soldiers would discover that I was one of Jesus' followers too and they would arrest me. That I denied him. I even swore an oath. Swore I didn't even know who he was. Some courageous leader I proved to be. Some bold follower of Jesus I proved to be. When push came to shove, I crumbled and denied him. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you've found yourself in a similar situation. One where you've been tempted to hide your faith in Jesus or even deny Him. Maybe it happened at school when the professor asked the class their thoughts on the origin of the world and the universe. Some of your classmates spoke up. They expressed their, their belief in the Big Bang Theory and the evolution of the world, but not you. You were too embarrassed to say what you believed, that God created the world. Maybe it happened at work. Your supervisor told you to doctor a few reports or maybe even shred a few documents to cover up something that wasn't quite right or that might look bad for him. You knew it was wrong, but you did it anyway because pressure from your supervisor. Or maybe it happened when you were out at a party with some friends of yours. They were drinking, they were cussing and swearing, they were telling jokes, dirty, filthy, raunchy jokes, and you laughed right along, drank right along, and swore right along. Looking back, you're pretty embarrassed about it, aren't you? Ashamed of your behavior, ashamed of your cowardice, ashamed of your denial of your Savior. I know how you feel. Let me assure you that Jesus died for that sin too. That's why He gave His life on the cross. To pay the penalty for our sins. To take them all away so that we wouldn't have to carry around that shame and guilt, but so that we might know that we're forgiven and our souls might be at peace. After his resurrection, Jesus went out of his way to assure me, to make absolutely sure I knew 
he had forgiven me. Let me assure you that he has forgiven you too. And then let me offer you a word of encouragement. Don't be afraid. Whether you're out at a party with some friends or you're discussing the origin of the world and the universe with your classmates or your professor, whether you're chatting with some coworkers in the office or called to testify before the leaders of your community, no matter where you are, don't be afraid. Stand up for what you believe in and speak up for your Savior, Jesus. Remember, you're not alone. You're never alone. Your good shepherd, Jesus, is with you always, no matter what. Remember, too, that he's given you his spirit to help you be a witness for him. He will give you the courage and the confidence to speak up for him just as he did us. And if all else fails, use our excuse. You know, it's not the brightest argument that's ever been heard in court, but it is the truth. Tell them you just can't help it. You can't help telling people about your Savior and his love for you and all that he has done for you. You just can't help telling people about Jesus. Amen.